So welcome everybody. Welcome everybody out there. You're joining the uh, 10 a.m. Wednesday service and we've been doing, what have we been talking about the last few weeks? Discipleship. Discipleship. So the good news, or a big part of the good news, is the discipleship. That we are given the opportunity to become like Jesus, who is the wisest, most loving, most powerful person that has ever existed. So I think that's pretty good news, uh, that through him we get to learn to have life in all its fullness. And we do have to learn, we don't just get zapped and all of a sudden are like Jesus. We have to learn, and if we're going to learn, we need them, which is vision, method, Intention. Intention. Nice one, Syrian. Intention. So we need to have a vision to aim towards. So if you're learning how to read, it might be one day, you know, you want to read the collected works of Jane Austen. <laughs> um, or for me, all of Lord of the Rings, when I was learning how to read. But you need a method. So when you learn how to read, you start off with your... <laughs> Janet and John. Your ABCs, your Janet and John, your... Your uh, small small picture books and work your way up to Jane Austen. But you can have the best method ever and the best vision ever, but if you don't have intention, they're worthless. And intention is that you're daily choosing to be, to be a student, to be a learner. So you need to have intention. Uh, we've learned about the square, and so we start off as unconsciously incompetent. We don't know what we don't know which is usually, we get quite excited at that point, but then we start realizing the stuff we don't know, and we find ourselves feeling consciously incompetent, which is quite a difficult time. <laughs> My poor son Frank, he's currently learning how to read, and um, yeah, he often feels quite discouraged, and feels consciously incompetent when he can't figure out what the word means, but eventually, you persist through this, you become consciously competent. So you can do it, but you might have to think about it. And if you continue to persist, you eventually become consciously competent, that you just seem to be able to do stuff. Uh, last week, we learned about, can you guys remember, the two, the two things that we need if we're going to be, if we're going to be students, learners, Jesus. I did a I did a matrix. You remember that? Can't remember what I did in the brief. <laughs> <laughs> so you need two things. You need nurture. Oh yes. You need to be nurtured. You, we actually need God's love. The God who tells us we need never be uh, afraid or ashamed. The God who loves us. The God who forgives us. The God who is for us, who, who would die for us. Uh, yeah, the God who calls us his beloved children. <coughs> we need to hear, we, we need to know his nurture, experience his nurture in our lives. But we also, as we heard from uh, our sentence this morning, we also need challenging. Jesus stands up and says, repent. <laughs> uh, this morning, our sentence for the day, for those of you who uh, didn't hear it, was to carry our cross, to lose our lives for Jesus' sake so that we might gain our lives. Jesus is actually quite a challenging person and uh, expects great things from each one of us. But we need both of those. If we spend that whole time just being challenged, we'll end up being stressed and anxious and uh, not experiencing transformation to become more like Jesus. If we, all, if we only have nurture and no challenge, then we might find ourselves a bit cozy, a bit lazy, and uh, again, never experience the, the transformation that Jesus has for us. But if we have uh, a decent amount of nurture and a decent amount of challenge, then we will experience uh, being empowered. We will feel confident to be able to step out and, and do, do things for God and start to experience that transformation in our own lives. 
But this morning, I wanted to talk about two things. I wanted to talk about, first of all, the vision that we need to hold on to. So going back to our VIM, so to think about what's the vision that we are aiming for for our lives. And then we're going to talk again about something that we need if we're going to, to reach the vision, reach the goal. And uh, continuing the, the theme of uh, shapes, this week we've got two shapes. We're going to have a triangle. And later on we'll have a, a, a semicircle. So you, got, you guys know your shapes, right? <laughs> By the way, everything that I'm, I've been doing, uh, other than them, all this stuff here and this stuff here, I've just been stealing from this book here. So all of my all my talks have just stolen from other people. So this is a book called Building a Disciple Discipling Culture by a man called Mike Breen, and he's with an organization called called uh, 3DM. So if you want to if you want a copy of this book, just ask me. I've got loads of copies in my study if you'd like to, to have one. But back to our shapes. So this here is a shape which will help keep us uh, with our eyes on the vision for our lives. And uh, if we're going to become more like Jesus, Jesus was a person who seemed to, who did, embody these three relationships. His whole life was about uh, loving people. All about loving people, being in relationship with people. And Jesus' primary relationship was with, with God, with his, um, with his heavenly father, his good heavenly dad. And so Jesus spent a heck of a lot of his time uh, with his heavenly father. So as he, when he grows up, we find him disappearing into the desert for 40 days to fast and pray and be with his heavenly dad. And then through the whole course of his, of his life and his ministry that we have recorded in the Gospels, he's continuously going to lonely places, we're told, to spend time with his heavenly dad, to, to build relationship. So he spent his life building deeper, loving relationships. And his primary one was with his heavenly dad. And I don't know if you folks have noticed, but if you want to have a good relationship with someone, you have to spend time with them. You have to spend time with them. If you don't spend time with them, whether it's a friendship or a marriage or parents and children or just a friend, if you don't spend any time with them, you're probably not going to have a particularly deep relationship with them. So Jesus worked really hard on building that relationship with his heavenly dad. He also called together his 12 disciples. So he actually intentionally called together 12 guys who would be his special friends. And then we also know he had other special friends, Mary and Martha, uh, Mary Madeline seems like he was quite close to it with his mom and his brother James. Uh, he had he actually fostered really close relationships, and in particular the ones that we hear about are with his twelve disciples. And then within the twelve disciples, he had three special mates, which was Peter and then the brothers James and John, who were his three special friends. So he spent a lot of time building. Um, I would say a church, friendship, we'll put down his, his 12 mates and his three best mates. And again, what did he do? He spent loads of time with them. He said, hey, come follow me. Everything I do, you're going to join me. We're going to get to know one another. We're going to get to love one another. And this, I would say, is, is the church. And then he also had... Um, his uh, 70 or his 72 disciples as well who followed him. And then I think there was even even bigger group, wasn't there? There was like 300 or 500 by the end of his ministry who were there with his ascension. So he tried really, really hard to build deep 
loving relationships with the people who were around him. And lastly, we see Jesus building uh, deep, loving relationships with what I call the crowds, or what, what the sorry, what the gospel called, calls the crowds. So he would go to a town, and he would just love and bless people. He would teach them about the kingdom of God. We're told everybody who came to him, who needed healing or needed setting free from dark spiritual forces, he would do it just freely. He just loved people and blessed people freely. So he built deep, loving relationships uh, with the crowds. We might. We might say the world, or our, our neighborhood. And so he had this relationship that was out to the world. Deep loving relationship with God, deep loving relationship with the close friends in the church, and deep loving relationships out into the world and its neighborhood. This gives us a really good vision for the purpose of our lives our lives, I think Jesus' whole life was, was basically based around just doing these things. These, his whole life was focused on doing these three things. Everything he did was for, to build these deeper loving relationships. Uh, to tell the world how much God loves us. Um, and it's interesting because there's kind of these relationships go both ways, right? So God loves us, he loves the church, and, uh, and that we love him. God loves the world. Sometimes you might meet people <laughs> who love God. Uh, and then as a church, we're called to love the world. We're called to love the world. And uh, just one last thing, if you don't like up in and out, another great way, if you take, uh, take an, uh, another great way to think about this, taken from our, from our creed, is that we're one. So we're one. Um, we are holy. So as a church, we're one. We're holy. We have a relationship with God. Uh, we are Catholic. So we'll, we'll do that with a little C rather than Roman Catholic. Just do another big C. <laughs> um, Catholic, that just means universal. So we're one. So we're all friends here at St. Augustine's. But then we also have a connection to the wider church around the, uh, you know, the Wellington region and around the world. And that we are apostolic. So the apostles, apostol, <laughs> thinking all my spelling. Uh, the apostles went out into the world and preached the good news. And preached the good news. So this is this is for us what our life should be based around: building deeper, loving relationship with God, with one another, in our world, our neighbourhood. Those people who might not know uh, Jesus and his love. And so this morning, uh, I want to finish off by talking about the semicircle over here. Because the only way that we can do all of this is if we're like Jesus and we cultivate our primary relationship with God. Our primary relationship with God, because we love because he, he, loved he first loved us. He loved because he first loved us. So it's out of our deep, loving relationship with God, our, nurture, our finding nurture and challenging God, that we are able to live out this life of deeper, loving relationships. If we don't have that connection, then it's not actually going to go very well for us. And I don't know about you folks, but for a long time in my own Christian journey, I spent a long time waiting for God to zap me, <laughs> to just make me into the kind of person who can do all this loving relationship, to heal me from everything. And there was a sense in which I personally hadn't taken any responsibility for my for my relationship with God. I just thought it was all up to God. It was all God's responsibility. And so I just, all I had to do is wait for God to zap me and everything would be, everything would be fine. And there were moments where God did zap me and God did speak to me, but it, it, I 
felt like I perhaps didn't experience the amount of transformation that I was hoping for. And then I kind of learned that, like all relationships, you know, it takes two to tango. Six of one, it's half a dozen of the other. And I needed to take responsibility for my side of the relationship with God. So just like in a marriage or a friendship, both people um, yeah, need to put in the time and the energy to build that relationship and to, and to love one another. And so this is what the semicircle is all about. And this semicircle is a pattern for our lives. And it's a pattern that says uh, we need both work and rest. We need both work and rest. And when I say work, I mean just I mean just life in general, but I also mean the kinds of things that Jesus asks us to do. The work of loving people. And uh, we need work. We need meaningful and purposeful work for our lives to be whole. Uh, for to experience the fullness of lives, we need, yeah, we need meaningful work. And I think in our culture and our society, we're, we quite like that. We we talk a lot about work. I know, and uh, yeah, I know lots of people, and myself included, at times when you say, "Oh, you know, I'm so busy." I'm just so busy. I'm just working so hard. I'm just so busy. And it's a real mark of kind of status. And I'm, you know, I'm so busy. I'm so important. I'm so needed. Uh, but I've also seen people who have bought into this whole trying to find your life in work. And it just starts to wreck their lives. You know, their families fall apart. Their relationships fall apart. Uh, they don't find fulfillment in their work. So for some reason, they just work harder and harder and harder and think maybe if I get that next role, or if I get that pay packet, then somehow life will be better. Uh, and eventually, at worst, people end up becoming burnt out, and their mental health gets ruined. And it's because we've forgotten that we need rest. And in the biblical story, we are told that we have a God who rests. It's one of the first things we learn about God. God, we, we find out that God is a creator, and he just needs to speak a word. He's a worker. Just to speak a word and he uh, creates everything. But then we're told he has a rest. <laughs> In the seventh day, yeah, that he has a rest. And then he tells his people that he wants, he wants his people to start every single week with rest. So we start our week as Christians on a Sunday, which is a Sabbath, which is a day of rest. And so we don't rest from work. We're actually commanded by God to work from rest. So we find our rest first, and then we work. So in the Jewish um, Old Testament mindset, the day doesn't start in the morning. The day starts in the evening before the day. So the day starts in the evening. You have a sleep. You have your rest, and then you work. But if you get all that wrong, if you know, it becomes all about work, then life quickly falls over. It's like when we're made, uh, we're made to rest, and we're made to work from a place of rest. And so you want um, a balanced life, which is balanced between work and rest, and working from rest, rather than the other way around. So we have a semicircle shape. Now, the last thing I want to say, is, the last thing I want to talk about, is about this word rest, because I think this is this is quite a uh, misunderstood word. And when I'm using the word rest, I'm meaning something very specific. So, uh, for me, for a long time, I thought rest was just sitting and uh, watching TV. Or binge watching, <laughs> binge watching TV, <laughs> or spending lots of time on social media, or you know, blobbing out uh, and not really doing much. But when we talk about rest in the biblical sense of the word, in the Jesus sense of the word, we really mean doing the things that help us to foster that relationship with our heavenly Father. So when we say rest, we're talking about the things that we do to foster that relationship. 
with our Heavenly Father. So we're talking about Sabbath, we're talking about worship, we're talking about prayer, we're talking about reading scripture, uh, we're talking about doing those things that help us to connect with God. And at the back of church, there's still a few bits of paper, but uh, there's a one guy, um, I've forgotten his name, his name's Gary. Anyway, he talks about nine sacred pathways. There's nine ways in which people are wired to connect with God. I won't go through all of those right now. But yeah, when I talk about rest, I'm not just talking about blobbing out in front of the TV. I'm talking about doing those things which help you to connect with your heavenly Father. And, uh, and so we have days and weeks and months and years which are organized around spending time with God. So just like in a marriage, you might have a date night or you might have a daily you know, catch up after work in the kitchen or whatever it is. It's about finding times in your day and your week and your month and your year to spend time with God. And I talk, I, I think about, for myself, I think about the, um, about whiskey making, single malt whiskey, when they make single malt whiskeys. It helps me to understand this uh, really well. Uh, so when you make single malt whiskey, apparently every single year, 2% of the whiskey disappears so that it gets stored in oak barrels and aged for many, many years. And every single year, you lose about 2% of what's in the barrel just through the, <laughs> through the porous wooden barrel. And if you Google, as I have done, 2% of a day, it's half an hour. If you Google 2% of a year, that's seven days. So to think in, in terms of, is there half an hour a day where I'm finding time just to connect with God? And keep it really simple, I would say, Read some scripture, read some bits on the Gospels especially, and just spend some time in prayer, in silence, listening to God, and then asking, you know, just putting your life before God for the things that you want, things that you need. And there's plenty of resources out there for reading scripture and prayer. Um, but half an hour a day, half an hour a day. And then over the course of a year, maybe a few times a year, taking yourself off for a day somewhere, just to spend with God or a day on retreat somewhere. But being intentional about finding that rest in God. About finding that rest in God. And I know for myself, the days where I don't take that half an hour compared to the days when I do, actually end up being very, very different kinds of days. <laughs> it's really, really worth it. It's really worth it. And it's only by doing that that we can do the work of building these deeper loving relationships, and then as we take responsibility for our side of the relationship, we start to experience more of the good news of our lives becoming more and more like Jesus. Thanks for listening. Turn that off. <laughs>